Hello, and welcome to Sim Radio here on the Sisters in Music Network. It's Monday Music Madness, and you're tuned in to Mixing It with Nikki Chris. This is Nikki, and in case you don't know anything about me, I'm a singer-songwriter from Raleigh, North Carolina. My show celebrates women in the music and entertainment industry, providing an avenue for them to showcase their talents. Our motto, Sisters in Music, Together We Are Stronger. My guest today is a Grammy Award winner and three-time nominee. She was the first inductee into the Indie Music Hall of Fame and has achieved several number ones and best album distinctions on her Time Art label. She is the author of Tune Your Voice Music Education Program, known worldwide for singing on over 1,000 recordings in film, TV, commercials, Live performances including Yanni, Live at the Acropolis, and both sister act films with Whoopi Goldberg, an accomplished vocalist, pianist, songwriter, arranger, producer, voice teacher, sonic therapist, author, and more. Please welcome the fabulous Darlene Koldenhoven. Darlene, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to have you here. How are you doing? Well, I'm thrilled to be here doing this with you. Such a wonderful concept for a show and to be part of the the network. It's just really a thrill. Thank you. Oh, you are quite welcome. You are known worldwide as a premier vocalist. For example, you were the featured soprano vocalist in the PBS television special and video, Yanni, live at the Acropolis, seen by over 1.5 billion viewers worldwide. And the second highest selling video to this day, surpassed only by Michael Jackson's Thriller. That's, like, massively amazing. Mm-hmm. You've sung... I know. I was, I'm, like, sitting here going, oh, my God, I'm a huge Michael Jackson fan and know that video very, very well. So this is yeah. a massive accomplishment. Yeah, You've sung you. on over 1,000 recordings in film, television, commercials, and you're known worldwide as the tambourine-waving choir nun in both sister act films. One of my favorite film series of all times. I absolutely love that film series. It's a classic. <laughs> it is a classic. It is. Yes. You've even had several of your own number one best vocal albums on worldwide radio charts. How long have you been singing? Well, people ask me that all the time, and I have to say that I got my start singing when I was only three years old. Easter Sunday, you know, church Sunday morning, and got up on the platform and I saw 250 people staring me in the face, <laughs> and 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 I was supposed to sing this song called "Low in the Grave He Lay," such a song for a three-year-old, right? But I got up on stage and I see all these people staring me in the face, and what does a shy three-year-old girl do? You know, I lifted up my dress so nobody could see me. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> and, and there I stood on the stage with my dress up. And my mother came rushing to the front of the stage, you know, the church platform. Darlene, darling, put your dress down and sing. And I put my dress down. I peeked up, put my dress down. Okay. And I looked at the organist. I said, okay, I'm ready now. (laughs) And then I launched into this song, you know. And uh, since then, I've learned how to keep my dress down when I sing in public. (laughs) It's helpful. (laughs) But that's a true story. Yeah, really. That stuff up. So, no. and that, you know, um, from there I got hooked on singing in front of people. So I got over the shyness about that pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, I love that story. Yeah, and, and then I went on, you know, I, I started cooking piano when I was nine. I went on to, didn't take voice lessons until I was 16. But I started, you know, I was in all the choirs and schools and stuff like that. And when I was 19, I won a contest and I sang a solo with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in Orchestra Hall, which is a big deal, a big operatic aria. And I went on to get my master's degree in voice, my bachelor's degree in music education from Chicago Conservatory College. And and then I went on to teach uh, elementary school music in the Chicago suburbs for about six years before I went and packed up and moved to Los Angeles at age 29 to seek my fame and fortune, as it were, with no connections. I don't know what I was thinking, but, you know, I didn't know better, so I just went. And I found out because I could read music really well and I had a five-octave range and I can interpret music quickly, those skills led me to 
make my living singing in the studios there, and that's how over the years I, I came to sing on you know over a thousand recordings. So I've that's, been very blessed, and I work very hard at it. <laughs> Yes, and I know that you you still continue to work very hard. I know that that you're super super busy, and we're going to get into some of those things that you've been working on, because now, even though I know that you've primarily probably focused on vocal releases, but now you're releasing your first solo piano album. Yeah. It's ready to release May 14th, titled "The Grand Piano Spa." So it seems now you're giving your voice to the piano. What made you decide to take this direction, and what is the title all about? Well, when we were all in lockdown from the pandemic, right, everybody was, there's a lot of agitation, anxiety, you know, grief, a lot of that going on. And, um, you know, before I was just, you know, a lot of singing and everything, but I always kept my piano chops up, and I decided this was, time to brush off the piano and and do something uh, to give the listeners calming vibes and some soothing support during these stressful times, and and as we look to a brighter future. So the original pieces are either improvised or composed, and they all give rise to visual images such as Wisteria with its descending melody or a song called Quiet Read written to help focus while studying or reading a book and Delphi's dream is almost a trance-like piece to relax and, and to dream to. And when it's a solo piano and you're listening to it, you get a sense of, oh, you know, she could be playing in my living room or she could be playing in, in the next room, you know. And when you have somebody mm-hmm. tinkling away on the piano, as it were, it, it can be a very intimate, one-on-one calming experience. And so that's why I decided to put it out, and that's why I'm calling it the Grand Piano Spa. Like treat yourself to a time at the Grand Piano Spa. <laughs> That's wonderful. How long have you been playing piano? Well, I started officially taking lessons at nine, but at seven, a really interesting thing happened. We got a piano in in our household for the first time, and my mother never played piano, but always wanted to. So she started taking beginning piano lessons, and I was raised in a very strict Dutch Calvinist household. It was only religious or classical music, and I wasn't allowed to touch the piano. So I laid under the piano bench, coloring while my mother was practicing. And she kept hitting this wrong note. It was a real easy beginner's thing. She kept hitting this wrong note. And I had never touched the piano before. But I got so upset with it and frustrated that I got up from my coloring book and I said, Mom, it's not that note, it's this note. And I remember playing the E above middle C and she looked at my finger and looked at the music and looked at my finger and looked at the music (laughs) and freaked out because I was right. (laughs) <laughs> and at that point, she slammed the lid down on the piano. She didn't say anything. She walked away, and she never touched the piano again, nor was I allowed to touch the piano again. I mean, it was oh. really freaky. I think it really scared her, you know, I mean. To, it was wow. uncanny. I mean, to this day, I think about it, and it was uncanny. I mean, how would I have ever known? But I did. It was something that happened, you know, and... It kind of flows along that line of, you know, the gift, you know what I mean? Yes. So then she took me to the piano teacher right away, and the piano teacher kind of stupidly said, well, we don't start them until they're nine. (laughs) Yeah, but I was ready at seven, you know. So I had to wait until I was nine to start, and then I took lessons every week. I'd walk a couple blocks to my piano lessons and took lessons every week, and studied all through high school and through college, and I was supposed to play the McDowell Piano Concerto with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra when I was um, uh, almost 20. And then I decided to get married when I was 20 instead of doing the concerto with the orchestra, and that's one big regret I have in my life because the marriage lasted two years. Meanwhile, I could have had such a great credit, you know. But, oh, wow. Um, yeah, I've been playing. Yeah, I've been playing, and and I never let it go. You know, if you if you read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers, ten thousand hours of practice, you know, makes you a master at it. So, before I moved to Los Angeles, I had ten thousand hours on piano and about thirteen thousand hours on voice. Wow. Before I moved to L.A., so even though I had no connections, I came as prepared as I could be without knowing 
how I had to be prepared for the Hollywood music scene. You know. but Definitely sounds like history. it. Yeah. Definitely. So what made you decide to publish a companion songbook with your original pieces from the Grand Piano Spa album? Well, I enjoy reading music and still to this day every once in a while I'll pull out a piece of sheet music or some, you know, Chopin or Beethoven or some new age artist, you know, that has a songbook and I've always wanted to have my own songbook. So now since I have my own album I I have my own songbook and I wanted to just give other pianists some beautiful music to play for their own enjoyment or to have a piece to play in concert or church or hospice or just for friends to just to share in that enjoyment like I remember it used to give me so much enjoyment too, just to whip out a piece of music and have fun playing it. Oh, that's great. I am a self taught pianist and I am horrible and I'm horrible because I struggle to find time to practice, Mm -hmm. but I was very, very intrigued and very much comforted by your album when I was listening through all the pieces. Oh, great. Yes, and to the point where I was sitting there going, you know, I think I might actually go get your songbook because I thoroughly enjoyed all of the music so much that I actually thought it might force me to practice more to right. expand my own playing because it was very calming and very soothing, like you had mentioned, you know, almost as if somebody was sitting in the room next to you or, you know, down the hall playing piano. So I was very excited to learn that you have the companion book. There's one piece in there named Soliloquy, that is a great piece for, you know, people that are lean more to the earlier side of practicing. I don't want to say beginner, but, you know, it's one of the easier pieces to play. You might want to start with that one. Okay, and, uh, cool. You'll probably get enjoyment out of that, and then you can move on from there. So, yeah, it's a it's an intermediate level to some of the sections and some of the pieces are for early advanced, but... It's for, you know, kind of beginning, intermediate, intermediate. In other words, there's simpler pieces and then there's more complicated pieces. So you can grow with it as you grow, you know. But it is inspiring oh, to, to play and stuff. So great. I'm glad to hear that. Yes, yes. I would love to now share one of the pieces from the Grand Piano Spa to play with Styria. But before we do that, can you tell us about this piece? Well, wisteria, I love the flower of wisteria, and that's that, you know, hanging. They hang, you know, these clusters, beautiful clusters of purple flowers, which is my favorite color. <laughs> so it's one of my favorite flowers. And I just came up with the idea of this piece, and the theme uh, is this descending little melody, a delicate little melody that goes in the, in the right hand. And it constantly you have this descending melody, which represents all the descending bundles of those wisteria flowers as they hang. And then the middle section is more like here comes the much-needed rain to make the flowers grow, the nourishment. And then it goes back to the sun comes out, and then here's the beautiful flowers hanging all refreshed and everything. So that's kind of what I was going through when I was thinking about writing this piece. So it's kind of a fun little thing for the right hand to play. I'm looking forward to learning it at some point in time. Just and start very I'm slowly. Actually, start very slow. Okay, I will start very slowly. All right, let's play this for everyone. This is Wisteria Off the Grand Piano Spa by Darlene Koldenhoven.
It's such a beautiful, soothing piece. And, and I don't know if when you were composing it, who your inspirations were, but one of the pieces that immediately came to mind when I was listening to this is Claire de Lune by Debussy. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea if that's the vibe that you were going for, but I did get a a little bit of that. You know, after playing so much music in my lifetime, things just stick in your head, in your subconscious. And it's actually more of, there's another WC piece that kind of starts with that little riff, but then it goes completely somewhere else. And the other day I heard somebody playing it. I don't know if it's a WC arabesque or whatever it is, but I heard somebody playing something, and, and I was like, "Oh man, that starts like just starts out like Wisteria does." So yes. it's just, it's the the motif is kind of common in the classical world, but it you know after the first few notes, it depends what you do after it, where you take it. So yes, okay, so I wasn't completely off then. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Debussy, Ravel, those were some of my most favorite composers. Oh, wonderful. Mm-hmm. So I would like to change gears for a little bit. You've authored and published a music education book with seven CDs or downloads mm-hmm. called Tune Your Voice, Singing and Your Mind's Musical Ear. Tell us about it and who can benefit from it. Well, I've had a lot of experience. I've taught over a 1,000 people how to sing. And all levels of people, from big stars, name stars, and to people that can't, as they would say, I can't hold a pitch in a paper bag, you know. So um, (laughs) to those people, I developed, um, and the book is for all levels, too, because it comes with seven instructional CDs. And it comes in a male version and a female version, and the female version works with kids as well all levels, all ages. It's made to train the ear to listen and to think musically, and it also helps folks learn the healthy way to sing. Especially for those struggling with pitch tuning, I created what I call the listening eye technique, which uses the eyes to alert the listening ears to focus on the voice. And it's a technique that's really simple to use, and it's really effective. It works immediately, and it helps people find their voice to match the pitch and to match with other human beings. And once that ear gets open to like, oh, that's what it's like, then you can take the person to through various stages and learning intervals like the interval of a fifth, you know, bum, bum, that interval is easier for people to grab right away, especially if people have pitch problems, then like, da, da, that's a too, too close to them until the ear gets used to it. So anybody can sing. How well they sing is a different thing. But to get people to feel confident in themselves so they're not embarrassed to sing Happy Birthday in a crowd or they're in church and they can sing hymns in tune now, to see the looks on people's faces when they get that, it's just such a thrill for me. It's so fulfilling, you know, as a voice teacher to be able to help those people to finally, after their whole life or whenever, to be able to to sing in tune. And then you take it from there, you know, like singing is a learned experience. It takes more than a year to get it together. It depends on your level and it depends upon uh, how much singing you heard going on in your household when you were an infant, you know, a young child. And a fetus, a four-month old fetus can hear the voice of the mother. So if the mother's doing a lot of humming and singing while she's carrying the child, and if the mother can sing in tune, it especially helps, generally the child is going to come out being able to sing in tune. If they have some other problems such as dyslexia, it may be a little more difficult, but it is something that they can learn to um, overcome, and I can help people with that through um, singing the exercises and tune your voice and through the sonic therapy that I do. Yes, and I was going to ask you about the sonic therapy because I'm actually very interested in this. My son has ADHD, Mm -hmm. and when I was reviewing your bio and and going through some of the things that that you sent me, this really stuck out to us Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as potentially something 
that he might be able to do. So could you, mm-hmm. I know that you're certified in sonic therapy. What exactly is it and how can it help our listeners? Well, when you learn how much the ear is the controller of everything, <laughs> and as I was like to say, the conductor of our own symphony in the body, then you begin to understand why the ear is so important. Sonic therapy uses the art of deep listening to especially acoustically processed music, which exercises the muscles of the middle ear. We have two little muscles in the middle ear, and if they're not moving just quite right, then they're not sending the impulses to the brain correctly. So what this does, it's like going to the gym for the muscles in the middle ear to maximize the nerve impulses in the brain and the connection that the ear has through the vagus nerve to the body and to the voice. The voice can only do what the ear can hear, for example. It enhances singing and speaking. Memory is improved. All brain function is improved. It helps with dyslexia, ADD, ADHD, autism, aging, PTSD, and and more. And people go, how can it do all of that stuff? Well, when you understand how the ear is in control of all this, then you understand. So, like, there are different frequencies that we listen to, high frequencies and low frequencies. And with something like ADHD, we would start on a program that emphasizes low frequencies and stay away from high frequencies. The same would be for autistic children. And then there's a spectrum in the middle, uh, frequencies, So, like, low frequencies from 125 hertz, you know, to maybe 500 hertz, 750 hertz, and then the middle, that's the sensory motor zone, and then the middle frequency range from about 750 or 1,000 hertz to, like, maybe 3 or 4,000 hertz, that's speech, language, communication, reading, a bunch of things like that, and then above that, 4,000 and above, we take it to 8,000 That's the creative zone, and it helps in a lot of other things. So there's a lot of different activities that we emphasize in each zone, and each um, person or child uh, is tested. It's great if they can be in person to have a listening test, and I can really see on a graph. It's like a hearing test, but it's more for listening because hearing is automatic. Listening is a choice. Yes. And so I can distinguish by the frequencies I can see by the graph what frequencies they're missing or what they're listening to that's not helping them. And so then they put on headphones and they listen depending upon the age, but about an hour a day for like 12 and up. And if they're under 12, we just have them listen in half-hour segments or if they're really little, then in 15-minute segments. And they do that for like, you know, an hour a day, let's say. And there's activities that you do while you're listening that help all the neural pathways in the brain. And so after about 40 uh, hours of listening, then you take a month off and then you do another 40 hours of listening. The doctor who created this, Dr. Alfred Tomatis, or Tomatis as they say in French, he recommended 80 to 100 hours of this listening. And it really makes a big difference. And you can start to feel, generally, most people start to see the subtle differences taking shape, you know, after about 20 hours. You start to see that. And it's pretty amazing. I've helped a lot of people. You know, people come into me for singing. They want to learn how to sing. And then I see there's all these other things kind of getting in the way. And so I'll ask, like I had a student, and the way she responded and the way she looked, her eyes looked, and so forth, finally I asked her, and make a long story short, and it turned out, yes, she had ADD, very bad. I did her test, and sure enough, there it was in the chart. It appeared in the chart, the listening chart. And I put her on the program, and she was blown away. She said, this is better than all the pills, the horrible pills they put me on when I was in high school. And she goes, now... I can function. One of her goals was to be a studio singer, which requires a lot of heavy concentration. Now she's doing some studio singing, and I got her singing and acting in a film that I did all the arranging for that's going to be coming out hopefully next year called The Nights of Swing, and she's just doing great. So there is hope. And uh, it's a pretty pleasant process to go through. If anybody, or if you're interested, you know, we can talk about it. I can give you, fill in with more details if people want to contact me. That's fine. You know. 
Yeah, and I think the website is the Listening Matrix. Is that what it is? Yeah, listeningmatrix.com. If people want to go to my own website, darlenecoldenhoven.com, you'll get to the Listening Matrix from there. If you go across the menu bar and look for the little subjects, it'll click over to that. So that's like the main hub, and you can find out about voice lessons and, of course, all my albums and the book and, you know, all that kind of stuff there, too. So. Okay, perfect. Yes. I will definitely reach out to you offline so that we can talk more about this because, like I mentioned, Great. my son and I were both actually very intrigued by this. So mm-hmm. I will right. definitely be contacting you. Great. So with that, this is a good place to pause and take a short break here from a word from one of our partners in podcasting, Chatting with Nat. We'll be right back on Mixing It with Nikki Chris here on Sim Radio. Chatting with Nat is a podcast for independent women seeking to speak their truth and to break down barriers. We host honest conversations that help to guide and empower women. Speak your truth and set yourself free. Let your voice be heard. And we're back on Mixing It with Nikki Chris on the Sim Radio Network and my guest, Grammy Award winner, Darlene Coldenhoven. Before we play another song off your new album, The Grand Piano Spa, it sounds like you are so busy with all of your projects and all of the teaching that you do. Do you have any time for hobbies? (laughs) Well, for a while, no, but now I do. I have made time for hobbies because I've realized it's very important, so... I like to try and keep my balance with sewing. I make all my own clothes. It saves money on stage gowns when I go and perform. And I love to sew. And I made a lot of masks when we first got locked down in pandemic, and I gave about 50 of them away to healthcare workers. And then my friends asked me to start making them for them, so I did that. And then then they match all my clothes, and people could pick out what fabric they wanted. It was fun. And recently I got a nice bike, and so I go bike riding just around the neighborhood. You know, I'm not ready to tackle the big streets yet, but I do some bike riding. And I got this really cute little dog. He's a rusty dog. He's part Chihuahua, part Spaniel or something like that. And I named him Puccini, P-O-O-C-H-I-N-I. And Puccini loves to sing, and he sings with me when I play piano, and he sings with me when I sing. And <laughs> it's the cutest thing. Oh, so cute. And so yeah, and he he loves to play, so we have a lot of fun together. Oh, you need to post that on Instagram. <laughs> I had a Dalmatian you... once that did the same thing. And oh uh, I got a great picture where I was teaching and the dog didn't exactly like the students. So the dog opened the door, came running in around the grand piano, jumped on my lap, put his paws on the keys and started howling. <laughs> <laughs> trying to teach the lesson. Well, the student happened to be a photographer, so she quickly whipped out her camera she had in her, her purse at the time, you know, and took a picture. So I will post that. I got some great, great pictures of that. That's just a hoot. Oh, that'd be wonderful. I'd love to see that. I would like to share, Emmanuel, with our listeners, what inspired this song. And I'm going to ask, did you do... Because I think there's two different vocal parts. Are both of those you, or did you have yeah. someone else come in and sing those pieces? No, they're, uh, that's me singing the whole thing. It kind of shows off some of my five octave range. Yes. Um, a, it's written by Michelle Columbier, and I was getting ready to do uh, my Heavenly Peace album. It's a holiday album, but it doesn't sound necessarily like a holiday, typical holiday album. But it's a beautiful holiday album. And I asked him if he had uh, any music that I could do, because I had sung a lot of demos for him before. And he said, you know, there's a one piece I would love to hear your voice do, this piece that I wrote. And um, one of the Marsalis brothers, uh, I forget which one, um, played it on the sax, you know, the soprano sax or something like that. And so I listened to it, and I fell in love with this beautiful melody. It was just awesome. And so... My friend Brad Cole did the arrangement, and uh, I recorded the vocal. That vocal is is basically a first-take vocal. I like to do my vocals as much as I can that way to make them feel like they're more live. So I'm pretty sure I did that one. That's one pass. That's a performance on that one. So 
Um, it's wow. one of my favorites. It's very moving. Every time I sing it, it moves me, and, and I understand from a lot of other people that are very moved by it, too. So I hope you and your listeners will enjoy this. I'm sure we will. And now that one is not on the new album, correct? That one was previously released. Correct. That's not on the new okay. album. That's on the Heavenly Peace album. Okay, wonderful. So here is Emmanuel by Darlene Koldenhoven. That was absolutely breathtaking. I literally got goosebumps when I was listening to that, and I'm a very picky listener, so (laughs) getting goosebumps is when I know it's something has definitely moved me. And your voice is literally spectacular, darling. Spectacular. You're very welcome, but it, it definitely is. I was blown away. That's why I was specifically asking the question if, if both of the lines were, were you because I, I thought that it was and I did, wanted to make sure. So Yeah, yeah. Breathtaking, breathtaking. One of the things that I do ask anyone who comes on my show that is a composer or writes songs is I ask if they have any composing tips or any songwriting tips that they would like to share. So I would like to ask you the same question. Sure. For the lyric writing part of the songwriting, it helps to write a little bit every day. And one of the exercises I like to do to to, uh, get warmed up or keep warmed up is a more of a stream of consciousness where you set the clock for 10 minutes And you have a pen that glides across the page easily and some lined paper, and you just go, and you start writing whatever comes into your mind. I mean, it could be like, oh, I have to take out the garbage today, and, you know, and we sat on this lovely park bench. It it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you let your mind go, and you just keep writing. Do not... 
stop the pen from the page. The pen is not allowed to leave the page at all for those 10 minutes. And you just keep going and going and going, and, and whatever comes out, comes out. And you do that a little bit, 10 minutes every day, and you start in a notebook. Put it, Get it in a notebook. And then you, you look back over that, and you start to see, ooh, this is an interesting line, or ooh, here's a topic I'd like to cover. And it's very inspiring. As far as melodies go, and with lyrics, one of my big pet peeves is a word called prosody. That means the accent of the syllable of the word needs to align with the accent of the music and the melody. And good prosody is easy to sing. When a song has bad prosody, it feels like you're walking crippled, like it's left-footed or something. It just feels very odd, you know, and it can come out sounding odd. Unless you are specifically using that technique for like a certain kind of rhythmic chant or something else like mm-hmm. that. But in general, you want you want to have good prosody when you're writing. Chord-wise, you know, harmonically, because a song is melody, rhythm, and harmony, of course, and lyrics. Good melody is everything. We all know if you write the melody and you write the, the lyrics, basically you've written a song. But harmony is also a, a very important part of the song. You can keep with simple triads, and certain genres of music only use basic major and minor triads. And then your more extensive music, jazz, uses a lot of different what they call extended chords and classical as well. And so it depends upon what genre you want the song to be in. Uh, that will help you determine how dense or how simple harmonically it needs to be. And same with melodically. If it's, and if you're writing for somebody who has a small range or if you're writing for somebody who has a big range, it's going to make a difference. Uh, what type of melody you choose. But the melody, to me, the melody is kind of almost everything. And even in a lot of pop music, they have like what I call monotone melodies. But then there's a lot of interesting harmonic structure going on underneath that. And so that can make a difference too. Even a song like Happy, when you think of the verses of that song, it's somewhat monotone, not entirely but where he makes the move off of the one main note makes a big difference in where it comes in the melody of the song and then what follows it. So uh, there's a lot to go in into that, but I hope that's answered your <laughs> some of your questions. Yeah, no, that was, that was great. That was great. And I'm a binge writer. I, I am not the right everyday person. <clears throat> I will sometimes go months without writing anything, and then it's literally a waterfall that just spews and yeah, then I'll stop too. again. I'm with you so, You're there. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of people do write every day, but I, yeah. I definitely like the ten minutes a day tip. Yeah. I think that's a that's a really good tip. And also yeah, it's good. about it's the good for skill development and it's mm-hmm. and it's good psychologically too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I would definitely agree with that. So before we get to learning a little bit more where people can find out about you, your website and things like that, we do have time to play one more song. So I do want to play Delphi's Dream off the, the new Grand album. Piano Yeah, yeah I love Delphi's Dream. That's one of my favorites. Very mysterious. Could you tell us what inspired that? Yeah, I was reading about the Oracle at Delphi and the uh, middle-aged women that they would have sit on the throne in the room with, and the vapors would come up from the ground and they'd go into these trances and spew out all this wisdom and knowledge, right? People, Men would come from all over the place to the oracle to ask things like, am I going to win this war and <laughs> what should I do and all these kind of things. But it's a very mystical sound. So I chose a Greek mode for it. It's, it's a Dorian mode. And in the left hand, there's like a simple ostinato, a repeating pattern that's very hypnotic. And then you have these simple melodies in the right hand. And just the, and then I use the sustain pedal a lot, so it kind of blurs the sound together and gives you that kind of vapor-like quality to it. And so there's like this rocking back and forth that might happen when they're in the trance. And it's just kind of all centers around that particular, you know, vision in my head. So. 
Wonderful. Well, we're going to play that. So here is Delphi's Dream off the Grand Piano Spa by Darlene Coldenhoven. I love that. You know, one of the things that I noticed in, in all of the compositions that I that I listen to, you're very good at telling a story. Every single one of them, as you've described it, mm-hmm. they all tell a story, and mm-hmm. that one does as well. And mm-hmm. you know, it's it's fabulous. I like to tell stories when I don't have when I don't have the lyric to tell the story. I have to <laughs> instrumentally tell the story. So. And that's the same true. With the that is absolutely with the true. You know, with the vocalese that, that Emmanuel is, you don't have a lyric to tell the story. So the voice 
just the tone quality and the way you move from one note to the next note in the vocalese has to be able to tell the story. You know. so yes, there's a lot of ways did, in music to do that. Yes, certainly agree with that, definitely. So where can our listeners find out more about you? I know that you mentioned your website, but books, albums, workshops, any concerts coming up? Where can they find out more information? Yeah. So I'm planning some free concerts on Zoom, and um, they're going to start at the beginning of May and run through May 20th. I'm actually challenging myself to do one every day. And so the listeners can go to my website, the DarleneColdenhoven.com. Let me just spell that out. D-A-R-L-E-N-E-K-O-L-D-E-N-H-O-V-E-N, DarleneColdenhoven.com. And they can go there and just, you know, sign up for one of the Zoom concerts if they want. It's free. People can go through my website. They can contact me through the website, and they can find out all about all my my work experience and things that I've sung on. People get a kick out of seeing some of that. And they can uh, see all my products, you know, the Tune Your Voice book and all my albums. I've got 11 now. And the, the Grand Piano Spa Legacy will be coming out in October, so I'm looking forward to that, too, later on in the fall. Now till May 20th, they can buy the Grand Piano Spa CD for only $5, plus a dollar shipping in the U.S. And they Great. can... They can find that on my website or darlenecoldenhoven.bandcamp.com. But that's the first thing they'll see when they go to just my website is they can click on there and, and do that. So I'm hoping everybody buys an album for, for five bucks. Maybe I'll get on the billboard charts. Yay! <laughs> yes, yes. I will be going and buying my, my album. And, and that Thank is an you. important statement, too, with... You know, everything that is going on nowadays in music and entertainment industry is one of the harder ones hit with all of the yeah. the restrictions. So yeah. every little bit helps. So yeah, skip the Starbucks and go buy Darlene's CD because, trust me, I know you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> you're welcome. All right. So with that... Darlene, thank you so, so much for joining me today. I have thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you. It's really been a pleasure. I'm excited for the new album. I wish you much success with it. I have learned a lot about Tune Your Voice and the Listening Matrix, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. So, everyone, thank you for tuning in, for mixing it. On behalf of everyone at Sim Radio, this is Nikki Chris. Until next time, keep on mixing it. Mm-hmm.